and develop one or two things that Neil said before we go into wider discussion. Um, I mean, one of the, the things that certainly made me think about uh, holding this meeting when we were discussing it a few weeks ago was uh, the, the response of other people that I talked to in the climate movement about costs of living, which I think everybody's taken seriously, but has tended to be around the kinds of things that we should be doing that could make a difference. And, and they're important, things like uh, retrofitting home insulation and things like that. But in a way, what I would like to just focus on is, uh, if you like, the kind of bigger kind of political thrust of, of what the cost of living and its connection to North Sea oil and gas tells us, uh, which is in no way to diminish the importance of those, those practical things as well. So, I mean, one, one of the things that I, I think we have to bear in mind is that the UK as a whole, and Scotland within it, is unusually dependent in uh, world terms, actually, on gas for heat. Um, the only European country that's anything similar is the Netherlands, I think. <clears throat> and in England, of course, quite a lot of electricity is produced by gas-fired power stations as well. So, you know, overall, gas plays a really, really important role. And that's why we're so hard hit when prices rise. Now, I mean, Neil talked a bit about this, but I think it's just worth emphasising that, you know, unstable oil and gas prices are not new. That's been uh, essentially, you know, the story for the last 50 plus years. There's been massive peaks and troughs. Um, I, it's funny how the, the most recent trough has been kind of almost forgotten about. I mean, I, it's only a few months ago that newspapers were talking about how will the North Sea survive because the price, the, the kind of set price had gone negative for a very short time. So, you know, in, in principle, they would pay you to take oil and gas. I mean, it didn't last for very long, but th there was a sustained period of very low prices, prices at which, uh, you know, the economics of production in the North Sea would, didn't add up at all. Actually, they would have been losing money hand over fist at those kind of those prices. Mm -hmm. now, so that market price, uh, the price that, you know, um, the is, is set as the kind of benchmark goes up and down enormously and um, and it's something that i mean it's interesting if you just listen to what liz truss and people like her say it's as if god declared that price and in tablets of stone and once it's there it's it's fixed and has to be observed um, it's, it's just nonsense and there's loads of examples around the world now and historically of states fixing different prices as well generally lower than the market price okay and that could happen now it could happen here but uh the new government has just chosen not to do that um okay um so you know in a sense you know if you're looking at this through the lens of the uk it's a bit different in in germany because in germany there is a a problem with supply because their pipelines mostly come from from Russia and some of them are switched off and there is going to be they, they actually have a lot more gas storage than we do but um, but nevertheless there's a problem with supply in the UK it's entirely a problem a crisis of of price and it's driven by dogma but and I don't think this is a, a necessarily a good thing but what it does do is it exposes in really stark terms the connection between the North Sea, North Sea oil and gas, you know, which is provides almost the entirety of what we use for heat, um, in a very very clear way, um, and you know, essentially it's not the case that we're waiting on some deliveries from Russia that are not there or something like that. <coughs> the the gas we use is generated on the North Sea. It comes through pipelines. You know, onshore in Scotland at St Fergus, 
it's processed it goes into the the gas grid and when you turn on the tap on your gas cooker or your gas boiler you know that is essentially this is a it's oversimplifying slightly but it's essentially you know continuous flow from one to the other and if it was stopped at source we would have, we would have a problem with supply but but the problem is is that uh, what we're being asked to pay for stuff which neil said it is you know, cost pretty much the same to produce now as it did three years ago is that's the real issue and and you can't and if i was a artist i think i'd like to you, you, there's a kind of two-way thing here. There's the gas flowing in one direction, and there's a, a kind of vacuum cleaner sucking money in the opposite direction out of our pockets, um, uh, and which heads directly to the the big oil and gas companies and the hedge funds that that own shares and the licenses to to the North Sea, um, and that's really really I do think I think lots of people have seen that connection. And I think it's one that um, when we've talked about North Sea oil and gas in the past, has not always, always been clear. Gas has been something that just kind of, it happens in some mysterious way. You know, it's a real material thing. And so it tells us something about really, I think, what we need to do um, both now and in the longer term. Uh, because the now is quite simply around the cost of living crisis. I, mean, I think it's an open question whether they'll have done enough. I, don't, I have my doubts as to what, you know, many, many, many people are still going to be in really serious problems this winter, despite the mm. uh, lack of this, the, uh, you know, the, the, the not such stars rise. But uh, what we've also see is, you know, that, then condemns us to high prices for the foreseeable future because we'll be paying back this vast amount of money over time. Um, and but there's another but and less talked about kind of connection between the North Sea as well because as Neil says, uh, Scottish government, the UK government, okay, thanks, Evelyn, and. Uh, sadly some of the unions are signed up to what's uh, called the north sea transition deal and it's not at all about transition it's about continuing production but it isn't just about oil and gas production it shapes what options are on the table in uk policy and what are not so hydrogen's on the table hydrogen has a place in the transition but it's vastly expensive and inefficient if it's used for for home heating um, nuclear's on the table because it preserves those hierarchies of uh, centralisation and power that the that the energy industry has been used to over the last last hundred years, um, and and that for me I think sends the message that you know there's a direct financial message that we we're, we're giving 130 or whatever number of billions of pounds to, to the big oil companies now. They've had net 250 billion from us over, over the last 50 years. Uh, so, you know, they've had, they've had enormous levels of subsidy, which are now continuing. And all at the kind of behest of a kind of market dogma. Um, and, you know, if we're going to really tackle this, then, you know, simply kind of taking the distribution companies into public ownership it's not going to do anything at all we need to tackle the route and take the um the production on the north sea into public ownership and i think that's important not just for the cost of living crisis but also for the future of actually a transition away to sustainable energy because until we do that there is no real evidence that um that the oil and gas companies are are seriously in, involved in that transition. They want to keep on producing oil and gas for as long, long as they can. And they'll pursue kind of greenwashing solutions like carbon capture and storage, saying that that will allow them to reach what they call a net zero oil production basin. You know, bizarre combination of words, really. So I just to just to finish, I, I, I my, my conclusion is that, you know, we 
need to be thinking really hard, and I hope we can do this in the rest of the discussion about, about immediate things around the cost of living crisis. But I think we've also got to keep in our minds and in our discussions and, and popularise, this. if we can't popularise it now, when would we ever be able to do it, popularise the idea that North Sea oil and gas is a problem, and, but it's actually we've got some ideas about how we can phase it down quite quickly, replace all that vast amount of subsidy going into renewables would make an enormous difference you know, in a very short space of time. And we can do it. So I'll stop there.